Okay, folks, welcome to the optics subunit of um, PHS 2062. It's great to be finally uh, lecturing you on something uh, in addition to seeing you all around the labs. We're going to um, <clears throat> do the next six weeks of uh, optics, which is a, a subunit that I wrote about four years ago. Uh, and we're going to cover a, um, a bunch of cool stuff, including uh, some formalisms you'll never have seen before but that make use of a heap of apparatus that you've, um, you've come to know and love um, through your studies. Uh, firstly, who am I? Hopefully you all know this by now, having seen me around the labs. Um, I teach into uh, these units, various physics units from second year to postgraduate. Um, I'd also like to get out to schools when I can to do things like play with giant soap bubbles uh, and also um, liquid nitrogen, bottle rockets and the like. My research is on quantum physics, um, specifically the atomic, the quantum physics of atoms, molecules, and light. And I make the coldest stuff in the universe. So these animals here are giant wave functions, almost a millimeter across, the biggest quantum wave function you'll have ever seen. And I do this in my lab um, with my co-investigator, Dr. Lincoln Turner, where we um, poke and prod these things and find out some, some wonders of the quantum realm at a giant length scale compared to the quantum physics that happens inside atoms. And I'm lucky to be able to have uh, a bunch of uh, undergraduates come into the lab and, and work with us, including Chris Bounds, who's uh, in the audience today. So this is where it all begins in my lab. It's a glowing ball of cold atoms um, that are at about one, micro, uh, one millikelvin, which for me is, um, is quite hot, actually. And we, um, we take this ball of levitating cold atoms and we cool it down to as close to absolute zero as any life forms that we know about have gotten to. So that gives us the claim that is the, is the coldest stuff in the universe. We get it down to about uh, a few hundred nanokelvin, or a few hundred billionths of a degree away from absolute zero. And once it gets that cold, some weird and wonderful things begin to happen, like it can be in two places at once. It can be traveling left and right at the same time. Um, and that quantum physics that's happening inside atoms becomes manifest on a length scale that's commonplace to us. So optics is um, everywhere in my lab and in, in my research, uh, even though it's specifically research on, on quantum physics. Um, we have to plumb light around the lab using optical fibers. Uh, to do that, we need to know a lot about the polarization to trap and cool the atoms. Um, and all the mundane things about pushing light around actually extends to the matter waves themselves. So we turn the conventional paradigm of optics on its head, whereby one manipulates light with matter, and instead we manipulate waves of matter with light. So all the lenses and beam splitters become made of laser beams, and the propagating medium is the actual matter wave itself. It's really cool. More broadly, in Monash physics, and now Monash physics and astronomy, uh, optics is ubiquitous. We have people doing cutting-edge research in optics throughout um, all disciplines in Monash physics, uh, from biomedical X-ray imaging, where we have some of the world leaders, uh, to gravitational wave detection, which you'll know of if you've played with the Michelson interferometer. If you want to know more about some of the great research that's happening uh, in the School of Physics and Astronomy, please come to the Honours Information Day. Um, even if you're not able to do honours in 2018, uh, obviously many of you won't be, um, it's worth thinking about now, and it's worth finding out who the people are that you might want to work with now so you can consider undertaking research projects with them next year and also just to give you a sense of you know, what might be fun to do in a couple of years at Monash. So as I said, optics is everywhere and it, it extends far beyond the School of Physics and Astronomy. Um, rather than look at these words, let's just look at some pictures instead. So optics helps us see. Optics helps us observe cool things in nature and ask, what does it all mean? These cats couldn't watch high-speed videos of themselves uh, were it not for the backbone of the internet being optical fiber communications. Optics helps us know where we are on Earth to within about one meter precision. The satellites whizzing around the Earth have to make corrections for general relativity and special relativity uh, using atomic clocks. And those atomic clocks are based on a lot of optics. Um, including the optics um, of inside atoms. Optics helps us play and compute. Uh, new forms of quantum computing are based on optical communication plat or optical computing platforms. 
Uh, optics helps us see the really, really small. It helps us see within ourselves. And it helps us see each other. It also helps us see deep into the cosmos, um, not just optically as we think of with visible light, but also with things like radio astronomy and X-ray astronomy. And finally, gravitational waves. Uh, these hinge on being able to understand and control optics to detect these compressions of space-time to within 1% of a proton radius. So I'm not going to um, not ask you what you know from your previous studies. I find that usually kind of has the geometric mean answer of... Uh, so instead, I'm just going to tell you what you know because I've looked at your syllabus, I've attended your lectures, and I know that in PHS 101.1, for example, you did two lectures on harmonic motion, two lectures on traveling waves, three on interference, three on wave optics, uh, a few on ray optics, unfortunately none on polarization. So a couple of years ago, polarization got nuked from the first year optics syllabus. Not sure why. It doesn't matter. We're going to um, study it again from scratch this year. Uh, so I'm not going to assume you know much about polarization. But all these other things are up for grabs. There's no point in me getting up here and repeating these things again verbatim. We're going to um, work on the assumption that these things are commonplace. And if you're unsure about these things, then now's a good time to um, ask me or go back to your um, first year text and brush off the cobwebs. So here's the optics subunit outline. We're going to focus on four topics. The first is geometric ray optics, where we'll use a matrix formalism to uh, cry no more tears with regards to having to do trigonometry. We won't have to do all the annoying uh, geometry and trigonometry that you think of with ray optics, because we're going to build it all into a matrix formalism. We're then going to look at how actual light propagates in the form of Gaussian beams. Uh, Gaussian beams are a great example of um, light that actually propagates in the real world, including this laser beam, but also light from these, um, from these down lights as well. And we're going to do that from the first principles of Maxwell's equation. Then we'll look at Fabry Perot cavities briefly, which are used to stabilize lasers and also make those exquisite detections of uh, path length difference in the, in the Michelson interferometer. And finally, we'll round things out with a study of polarization, um, restoring the vector nature of light, but also applying another kind of matrix formalism. Uh, to do all the heavy lifting of the mathematics for us uh, to transform states of polarization. So there'll be a few common themes throughout the subunit. Uh, one of them is the power of linear algebra. Um, your excellent linear algebra lecturer, Tim Garoni, has hopefully put you in good stead for how to manipulate matrices and column vectors. Uh, we're actually going to do some stuff with it. And the stuff we do will be very disparate, uh, but it'll all have this common thread of the power of matrix mechanics which uh, actually follows through all the way to quantum physics as well. Uh, if I had time, but I don't, I'd talk about interferometers more because, heck, they're amazing. And um, I'd also try and talk about toy models of atoms because that's fun too, but we probably won't get time to do that. <clears throat> so the theme here is um, being a master of some trades and a jack of none. Here's the, um, anyone know where this is? Yeah, it's right next to Hal. So um, this is a quote from uh, Isaac Newton. Apparently this is uh, a tree from the cuttings of his famous apple tree. Uh, it's in Kenneth Hunt Garden. And um, the gist of the quote is, well, let's have a look at what, what Newton actually said here. Uh, to explain all nature is too difficult a task by any one human or even any one age. Tis much better to do a little with certainty and leave the rest for others that come after you than to explain all things by conjecture. And this is in his um, uh, Optics of 1704. Another way of, um, of putting that is uh, it is better to be um, a master of some trades and a jack of none. And that's what we're going to focus on here. We're going to just choose one or two, or in this case, four choice examples and get really, really good at understanding those uh, couple of things. G'day. All right, so what resources are available to you? Well, uh, there are some notes on Moodle. Uh, these are a set of handwritten notes uh, that I've made for you at the start of um, when I wrote this subunit a couple of years ago. I understand that um, we're not going to have time to get through a 700-page book in the next six weeks. Uh, this is the book, however, that the notes are based upon, broadly speaking. Um, you'll have lecture slides to work off as well and worked examples through the lectures. The textbook is a, a good reference. There's copies in, um, in HAL. I think some of them are on reserve, if that's even a thing anymore. Uh, it comes in various flavours. They look like this. 
Mathematica is obviously a huge resource to you, and you'll get to do um, a bunch of your assignment in Mathematica, but also the computational workshops um, will focus um, heavily on applying the stuff you've done in lectures uh, in, those, in those exercises. Assessment is pretty straightforward. It's in the unit guide. 3% for the tutorials, their compulsory attendance, uh, computing workshops, assignment and quizzes, and the exam. Any questions about this breakdown? Yes? Oh yes, pre-lecture quizzes. Um, watch this space. I th we'll probably have pre-lecture quizzes. They'll make up some nominal 1% or something. They'll be built into the um, uh, assignment and quizzes. Yeah, of 7%. So the computational workshops are as follows for optics. The first one is called See the Matrix. Hopefully we'll go from that to this. The next one is Hater's going to say it's fake, or Hater's going to say it's Photoshop, where you'll simulate a cloaking device made of four lenses. And we'll actually bring this cloaking device in, uh, here demonstrated by Stalker Space, Heartthrob, Chris Watkins, and um, Seb Temponi, uh, who may, you may have had as a um, lab demonstrator. Uh, and here, Chris is actually holding a donut within these, this four lens objective. And you can actually see straight through the donut, not just because donuts have holes in them, but the donuts actually disappeared. And you'll simulate how this cloaking device works in, um, in the second computational uh, workshop. For optics. And finally, the last computational workshop of the semester is called Prepare the Laser uh, because you'll simulate uh, laser propagation and how to actually measure a laser beam waste from real data uh, that I took in my lab. All right, so the first uh, topic of our subunit is geometric ray propagation. Um, now it's probably a good time to remind ourselves um, what these animals are, wavefronts, rays, and, um, and the optical axis. So in three dimensions, the kind of uh, kitchen sink diagram is shown here from Hecht. There's some source. It's emitting some wave fronts, which are these shaded surfaces. And rays are the tangents to these uh, curved surfaces. You'll notice also that this diagram has an axis of symmetry. That's called the optical axis. So in our study, we're going to consider uh, perfect symmetry around that axis to keep things really simple. And we can do one of two things. We can do the full wave propagation theory and study how these wave fronts evolve based on, um, on wave propagation. Or for a moment, we can suspend our judgment and just consider the um, path of these rays, the th lines that are tangent to wave fronts. And for a good few hundred years, that served us very well. And that's what we're going to do for the first few lectures of this subunit. Uh, so a convenient way to collapse this diagram is into two dimensions, of course. And we're going to have ray bundles that are propagating from left to right across the screen. Uh, and the optical axis will always be the horizontal axis. So this begs the definition of um, a ray vector. This is the workhorse of ray optics. It's the thing that defines um, one element of such a ray bundle. Um, and we have to have uh, two numbers to describe it because it's a vector in two dimensions. Now, you might think that we could use just x and y coordinates to describe it. Um, but for actual practical purposes, it makes more sense to use uh, the displacement of the ray from the optical axis. So we'll always consider where the ray is at a certain location along the axis. In this case, um, where I've drawn the uh, vertical line going down. And we'll also describe it with a second number, theta, the angle that the ray makes from the optical axis. So these two numbers, uh, the displacement y, or sometimes referred to as the height y of the ray, and the angle, um, are both positive when the ray is above the axis and pointing upwards. Uh, in this example, that defines our sign convention. So if you were to have a ray pointing downwards, uh, it would have a negative angle, and that could be negative even if the ray was above the axis to start off with. And as you'd expect, these parameters of the ray, its height and its angle change as the ray propagates through some optical system. That optical system can be um, refraction through uh, a boundary, it can be propagation through optical elements, or that can be considered as the entire black box of stuff, and we want to know uh, how the numbers, how the ray on the way out dep depends on the ray on the way in, defined by two numbers on the way out, the displacement and angle, and two numbers on the way in, the displacement and angle. So let's look um, at two examples of this to, um, to make this concrete. So we want to know, for example, the most simple thing a ray can do, and that is just propagate through free space. It's a straight line describing the propagation of light, 
we want to know how to transform these two numbers, uh, y and in this case I've defined it as alpha, um, as it propagates uh, through some homogeneous medium. Let's have a go at that. So we're going to also make this um, small angle approximation to keep life um, really simple. And that's going to um, allow us to define the height delta y here, which is normally uh, d times tan of alpha i. That's going to be approximately equal to uh, d times alpha i. So this small angle approximation is going to um, be used again and again, and it's going to basically take all the tans and make them um, alpha. So tan of alpha becomes alpha, and sine of alpha will become alpha as well. And that will make the trigonometry really easy. So we're looking at small deviations of the ray uh, from the optical axis. So that tells us how much the height of the ray has increased as it propagates through a distance d. Let's now put it in terms of these um, initial and final displacements. So that means that yf is going to be equal to y initial plus delta y, which is just y initial plus d times alpha i. And because the, uh, the ray is travelling in a straight line, there'll be no change to its angle. And that means that alpha f will just equal alpha i. So no change in angle. The second least uh, simple example, so we're going to build up from the simplest things, uh, is refraction at a planar interface, something we've studied many times before. In this new language of, of ray vectors with the two numbers, we again want to find the final height and final angle based on the initial height and the initial angle. Uh, the height change is easy, it's zero. So we have the final height equals the initial height. Now the um, change in angle depends on the refractive indices, of course. So we have to use Snell's law. And that tells us that um, nf times sine of alpha f is equal to ni sine of alpha i. But again, we're going to make the small angle approximation and write this as nf alpha f is approximately equal to ni alpha i. Now, in both cases, we have uh, a set of simultaneous linear equations. And that was the benefit we got from making the small angle approximation. So we rewrite those equations, um, and we can see much more clearly how these are two, sim two sets of simultaneous linear equations, with the final variables y and alpha, depending on the initial variables, via some constants. And because these are simultaneous equations, we can write them, of course, uh, in vector form. So we're going to write as a column vector the ray's final height and angle. in terms of the ray's initial height and angle. And it's the fact that these are simultaneous linear equations that allows us to put it in this form. And now I can just read off the four elements of that matrix by looking at the coefficients of the simultaneous equations. So those, if those are coefficients are 1, d, 0, and 1. Uh, ditto for the refraction at the planar interface. So these um, are just the vector form or the matrix form of those two sets of simultaneous equations. And you can think of this matrix, uh, this matrix here as transforming this ray vector into this one. And this matrix here transforms this ray vector into this one for refraction at the planar interface. So in general, we'll see this um, theme over and over again, which is that for any optical system that'll uh, that obeys the paraxial approximation where the ray doesn't deviate too much from the optical axis, we will always be able to find a set of simultaneous equations that describe the passage of the ray. And those simultaneous equations will be defined by four parameters A, B, C and D. So uh, very uninspired, 
let's just call the transform matrix the ABCD matrix. I think I've already got this here. Yeah, so that's um, the vector form of that equation. And this defines what we call the ray transfer matrix, uh, sometimes called M or the ABCD matrix. If you are going to use the textbook, um, there is a strange convention here that Hecht uses. Um, he puts the displacement as the bottom element of the column vector, and he also multiplies the angle by the local refractive index. Uh, this is the only place in modern optics this is done, so we're not going to follow um, Hecht's convention here. It also um, is worth pointing out that this column vector comprised of these two numbers is purely a mathematical convenience. Don't think of this as some vector in, um, in R2, in XY or Euclidean coordinates. It's not. Um, for starters, these things have different units. So the displacement has a unit height, and this has unit angle. Uh, you can't think of this as describing two coordinates in 2D space. Instead, it's just an abstract animal that helps us keep track of those two numbers that describe or define a ray vector. Yes? So they're, they're, not, they're not polar coordinates? They're not polar coordinates, no. Um, they're not polar coordinates because the thing with unit length is not a radius. It's a, it's a height from the optical axis. Yep. Yes? It's um, wherever you choose to uh, define the ray, in this case, um, let's look at the, inter the entrance to this surface here. Uh, y defines the height of the ray at that point. So you can choose to draw the vector um, at the tail or the head. In this case, I've drawn the, the ray entering the surface with its head at the surface. Um, but it's the height of the ray at that surface. The tail. Right. Yeah, uh, in this case, at this particular position along the optical axis, I've chosen to um, draw the ray um, at the, with its tail coming out of the, of the surface. Again, you can think of these as an infinitely, uh, infinitesimally short vector, and you'll always have the definition being the same. Um, but you should think of this y and alpha depending on where you are along the optical axis. That's a good question. <clears throat> OK, so more, in a more abstract sense, we can look at pictures like this with some arbitrary optical system comprised of lenses and mirrors um, that all distort the ray in some way. And now this picture of getting these two numbers out from these two numbers that go in uh, just becomes one of uh, a two by two ray transfer matrix problem. Uh, why is this useful? Well, aside from being able to throw away all the trigonometry um, after we do one or two derivations for each new circumstance, we can also stack multiple optical systems together so the action of putting things together um, under propagation, again, with some kind of lens or, um, or free space propagation, just becomes uh, the action of multiplying all these matrices together. And you guys can multiply two by two matrices together in your sleep at this point, hopefully. Um, the only thing to remember here is the order of multiplication. So uh, if we want to transform this initial ray with, with uh, displacement Y and angle alpha, after action through M1, M2, and M3, we have to be careful on how we multiply these matrices together. And shown here is um, that care taken with a, a cascading number of brackets. You can see that I've actually multiplied the matrices M1, M2, and M3 together right to left, because M1 acts first on the ray vector, then M2, then M3. So the matrix multiplication is M3 times M2 times M1. All right, let's do another example, which is refraction at a spherical interface. Uh, propagation through free space gets us a long way, and so too does refraction at a, at a planar boundary. But we're not going to be able to build lenses uh, unless we can solve the problem of um, defining refraction at a spherical interface in this new formalism. So the, um, the thing we have to do here is uh, write down some coordinates that allow us to pass this problem in our new formalism. And again, I've, I've got this um, case here where I want to consider refraction at this exact position along the optical axis where the height of the ray has not changed at all. So I really want to just put this in terms of the problem of what happened to the angles alpha 1 in terms of um, or what happened to the angle alpha as it goes from alpha 1 to alpha 2. So you guys know this problem in terms of Snell's law. 
which in a small angle approximation looks like this. It's um, n theta 1 equals uh, n1 theta 1 equals n2 theta 2. But theta 1 and theta 2 are the angles of the ray to the normal. And in this case, that isn't the, um, the coordinate system we're using. So we have to um, rewrite theta 1 and theta 2 in terms of alpha 1 and alpha 2. And we do so by identifying uh, with some similar triangles that they're related by uh, this angle alpha. Uh, sorry, gamma, which defines the um, center of the lens with respect to where the, uh, where the ray intersects it. So we know that um, alpha, uh, gamma is related to the radius of the lens and the height that the ray comes in. And um, here is the point where we have to define or decide upon a sign convention. So let's do it based on this drawing. This drawing is one of a concave lens or a concave surface. Uh, I'm sorry, it's <laughs> it is a convex surface. I always get the two mixed up. Concave is when uh, your ray is going into a cave. Clearly here it's, um, it's hitting the outside of some um, outwardly curved surface. So we define this radius of curvature as being positive. Um, the math all works for the concave case. You just have to set the radius of curvature to be negative. And then we have to figure out um, how to uh, write alpha 1 in terms of alpha 2. So let's just rewrite Snell's law by substituting in the expressions for, um, for theta 1 and theta 2. And I've also um, substituted in the value for gamma because that's uh, an angle we can just immediately eliminate. Okay, so that's Snell's law in terms of, um, of numbers we actually care about. The height hasn't changed. We don't need a y1 and y2. We've just got that single y. All we have to do now is um, solve for alpha 2. And we can probably simplify this a little further if we... Um, took out a uh, factor of y on r from the front here because we want to ultimately write this in terms of a simultaneous equation. And that's going to allow us to put it in terms of, um, of a simultaneous equation uh, which has a transfer matrix that looks like this. So in this case, we can pass this transfer matrix as um, in, the, in what it does physically to the ray. We can see that the output angle depends on the input position and angle, which is different to refraction at a uh, planar boundary. There, the output angle only depended on the, in, on the input angle. There was no such thing as a radius of curvature. It didn't matter where the ray hit the planar surface vertically. Here, it very much depends on where the ray hits the, hits the curved surface vertically. Uh, the further up the ray goes, the more it will refract. And also, we can see from this matrix that the input, uh, the output displacement doesn't depend on the input displacement, which is why um, this element of the matrix is zero. So there's physics encoded in this, um, in this matrix because this matrix just describes those simultaneous equations. Right, now we're able to, um, to stack these multiple optical elements together to build thick and thin lenses. So let's break it up into three stages. The first stage is going to be refraction at the curved surface uh, defined by radius of curvature R1. It's a uh, convex surface with positive radius of curvature with respect to the incident ray. We're then going to propagate through the lens a distance H, uh, which has a refractive index N2. And then the ray will meet a concave surface uh, with radius of curvature R2 on the way out. And that R2 is going to be less than zero based on our previous defined sign convention. So the total system matrix then looks like this. We start off with M1 on the right. We then propagate for a distance H. And we then refract out of the curved surface again, uh, getting us the final, um, the final uh, ray transfer matrix. The cool thing about this is that when we want to build something simpler, we just take that middle element to be zero or vanishing. And we can do that by um, setting H to go to zero. And you can see that that's quite nice physically because then its tray transfer matrix becomes the identity. And we're left with a, 
um, multiplication of two matrices. And if we do take that um, simplification for the time being, we'll see that we get the expression for uh, the thin lens, which is a lens of uh, zero thickness, so the ray propagates um, by an insignificant amount through that lens. Let's just take a look at the um, ray transfer matrix for a thin lens again. Uh, again, we've got the fact that the height of the ray won't change because the lens is infinitely thin. That's why this element's zero. Uh, but now, the angle that the ray makes on the way out depends on its height in a way that uh, also depends on the refractive index ratio and the radii of curvature. This, not, this makes sense. Uh, it tells us that we can build different lenses with different focusing powers by simply changing the radii of curvature on the front and back surface. So as an exercise, um, you can show that uh, the resolving power, sometimes annoyingly called D, or script D, um, is related to this bottom left expression of the ray transfer matrix. And it's also the reciprocal um, of the focal length of the lens. So let's actually think about what defines the focal length of a lens. And I want you to tell me um, what defines the focal length of a lens by answering um, this poll. So throughout this next few lectures, we're going to be using um, Poll Everywhere. And you can log into Poll Everywhere for this unit by going to pollev.com slash phs2062. Um, or you can text the unit code to that uh, number, and it will re re register you for this um, unit to use Poll Everywhere with. So what is the focal length of a lens? Looks like, uh, is the poll open for anyone? Yes, okay, let's have a look at this. Okay, so most of you are saying that the focal length of a lens is the distance after which all parallel incident rays converge. Interesting. Some of you think it's where the, an image is formed, and indeed lenses uh, do have something to do with forming images. There's also this um, twice the radius of curvature of the lens and the distance that some diverging rays propagate before becoming parallel. Oh, it's quite reassuring to, um, to, to see that most of you um, think that the answer is B, um, because this is one definition of a focal length. Um, the distance after which... Oh, there we go. That is completely the wrong pole. Yeah, the distance after which... the uh, Distance after the lens where all parallel incident rays converge. So um, let's now have a go at, um, at solving this problem to show that um, this is indeed a sensible definition for the focal length of a lens. So in the exercises, oh, sorry, in the notes there are a bunch of these exercises. Some of them I'll do in lectures and some of them I'll leave for you to solve in tutes and in your own time. Uh, here's an example of one where I'll actually go through and, um, and do the solution um, right now. So we want to show that This, uh, this script D, the resolving power, is related to what we would consider intuitively to be the focal length of the lens, or um, it's reciprocal. Nothing's coming up on the screen. 
Oh, yes. Thank you very much. All right. So to focus all parallel rays, we require that in terms of our new language of ray transfer matrices, that a ray with displacement y and, and angle 0 is transformed to a ray with 0 height and some angle that might depend on the displacement after a particular distance. And we're going to say that distance d is going to equal f, the focal length. So let's draw a diagram to um, remind ourselves what we're looking at here. This is our thin lens. That's the ray entering the lens. And indeed, this ray is described by this ray vector uh, y0. It doesn't have any angle. It's propagating parallel to the optical axis. And it is going to propagate some distance d at which point it's going to um, intersect with the optical axis. So to do this um, problem with ray transfer matrices, we're going to need to break it up into two stages at least. The first one is propagation through the lens. And the second one is propagation through free space. So we're going to define a, a new ray transfer matrix uh, M, which is going to be the product of the two matrices M3, which is going to go on the left, with M lens. So we know what these two matrix, uh, matrices are now because we just derived them. The first one is the ray transfer matrix for free space propagation. And the second one is the ray transfer matrix for this lens. And remember that this um, big expression, script D up here, is the negative of the bottom left-hand element of our ray transfer matrix, which allows us to write that matrix concisely as such. Uh, now I just have to um, do the mul matrix multiplication. Okay, so that's going to be the, ma the ray transfer matrix for that entire system. Now let's actually act upon the ray that we defined at the start uh, with this ray transfer matrix. The requirement that this ray intersects the optical axis after some distance d uh, means that we're going to have to uh, solve the, ex the equation where this is just 0 and some angle that depends on the height y, the initial height y. And we can just solve this for r for d. Now, this has to work for all incident rays that are propagating parallel to the optical axis, no matter what their height. Uh, so straight away, you can see that this means that 1 minus d times d equals 0, or that the distance is equal to negative 1 on d. <coughs> Sorry, it's equal to 1 on d which uh, actually solves our problem of finding the focal length. 
So the focal length is just the reciprocal of that um, bottom left-hand negative expression for the, um, the thin lens transfer matrix. And happily for us, the focal length doesn't depend on the initial height, nor should it for a thin lens. So that's a good sanity check we can do as well. I'll also put these um, worked examples up on Moodle after each lecture. Sarah, yes. Quick question. So what if your lens is like really long in the wide direction? Isn't it at some point that a small angle approximation get a breakdown? Um, you mean like it's really, really extended out? Yeah, from the so like the, the rays are going to be like at a massive angle. And so then like your L sine and alpha sine equal to L. It's OK for the optical element to be quite large vertically as long as the rays that we're considering don't deviate much from the optical axis. They can, they can enter that um, lens at quite a big height as long as they do so at a shallow angle to the optical axis. Right. Yeah, so that we, we're going to enforce the praxial approximation the whole way through this, otherwise the whole matrix formalism is out the window. But it turns out this matrix formalism um, is of huge practical benefit and gets us a long way. So um, now that we know how to make a lens and define its focal length, we can also think about making images with lenses. Uh, and we can remember that an image is created, uh, in this case of um, the Reddit icon, when uh, you have all rays at a given height, yi, arriving at the same yf. And it doesn't matter what angle they're coming out of that initial source at. So this is the condition for image formation and it's independent of the angle. This means that in terms of a ray transfer matrix describing this entire system, um, the change of the height doesn't depend on the initial angle, and that means that this B element of the ABCD matrix is zero. Uh, we can think of these elements of the ABCD matrices as these partial derivatives, even though it's a bit contrived because it's a system of linear equations, the partial derivatives are always constant, but um, the change in height uh, not depending on the initial, initial angle, is indeed the condition of image formation. It also straight away allows us to define the magnification in terms of, um, of another element of the ABCD matrix, which is A, because in this scenario, the A element of the ABCD matrix is simply the ratio of the final height over the initial height. This only works when the whole thing is an imaging system, uh, but it is another way you can extract physical information from this ray transfer matrix. So once you've um, done this a couple of times, you'll probably be fed up with it and want to do it inside a computer. And indeed, um, a heap of ray tracing software does the matrix mechanics we just looked at today. Uh, it just takes in surfaces with particular radii of curvature and, um, and separations and just does the matrix mechanics the whole way through and tells you exactly what you'll see as an image or what um, resolution you'll get when you build an imaging system. And this is how telescopes are built. Um, it's how um, cameras are built. It's also how we um, build uh, optics in our lab to uh, manipulate laser light to push atoms around with. So what it doesn't take into account is, um, as you were saying, uh, breakdowns in the praxial approximation when the angles get big. Um, but it does allow you to compute a whole bunch of imperfections of imaging systems, such as uh, aberrations, astigmatisms, and distortions. So in my lab, we use ray tracing all the time. In fact, um, we have entire uh, honours projects that have been based on, on ray tracing to build the um, optics that you see on the uh, experimental apparatus right here. So some of these optics take laser beams that are the size of a human hair and they expand them to uh, the size of a fist or about a couple of inches across. So this zoom lens was made by um, someone that, who's actually quite familiar to you, Lisa, Dr Lisa Starkey. Um, it expands the beams um, by using a series of objectives which we modelled using ray tracing software. Uh, because we needed um, to levitate the atoms in all directions, uh, she made six of them, shown here. Uh, and indeed, we extended this work into making a high resolution objective um, for imaging cold atoms as well, uh, using the same ideas of ray tracing, uh, shown in this red ray trace diagram there. Uh, this is in its own right a scientific endeavour, and uh, we got a paper on this a couple of years ago, uh, which has been used by heaps of labs around the world to put high-resolution objectives outside their vacuum systems. So um, that's the end of today's lecture. Uh, next time we will um, extend our ray, trans ray tracing formalism uh, to do some more cool stuff. <laughs>